Welcome to the Scientist Lab Talk, a special edition podcast produced by the Scientist Creative Services team, where we explore topics at the leading edge of innovative research. This episode is brought to you by Miris Bio. Miris Bio pioneered scientific breakthroughs in non-viral gene delivery and continues to produce world-class transfection reagents. Now, as a global leader in transfection technology, Miris Bio provides life scientists with the most advanced tools for gene expression, biotherapeutic protein production, virus manufacturing, and genome editing. In this episode, Nikki Spodge from the Scientist Creative Services team spoke with Josh Snow, Director of Business Development and Marketing Strategy at Miris Bio, about the past, present, and future of gene therapy with a focus on how researchers can transition their successful therapies to clinical trials in the market and the cost involved. Now, Josh, tell me a little more about your role at Miris. Thanks, Nikki. I'm the Director of Business Development and Marketing at Miris Bio. Over the past, getting close to nine years now, I've held different positions, both technically focused and on the sales and marketing side of things. My colleagues at Miris are a group of scientists. They have a very intense focus on gene delivery and have for 25 years now. We obsess over transfection, and now we're getting more involved in the GMP manufacturing space for viral vectors that are used in gene therapy. Now, Josh, gene therapy was once regarded as a highly experimental technique, but it's now becoming a reality. How did this field get its start? The concept of gene therapy arose in the late 1960s, early 70s. The first published paper on the idea was in the early 70s. Between that time and the early 90s, momentum built up in basic and preclinical research. And the first patient to be treated was in around 1990 for defect in adenosine deaminase. So my boss, the president of our company, Jim Hagstrom, and our former president, John Wolf, were early pioneers in gene therapy research. We lost John in April of this year. He passed away from esophageal cancer, which was really devastating to us. We're a tight-knit group, and John was an amazing scientist and mentor and friend. I mean, he was just one of these people that you couldn't help but like kind of bond with when you interacted with him. So I'm very sad to see that you know he's not around to, to see this story continue to unfold, but his contributions were very important for the field. His story is sort of one of those classic moments in science where it was a a negative control that really got their attention. They had been developing synthetic chemical carriers, non-viral, for DNA. So this is lipids, polymers, protein. And Jim and John and others at the time, our other founder was Vladimir Budker. And this all came out of the work from the University of Wisconsin. But they thought this was really the future of gene therapy and transfection, these non-viral methods. And it turned out that was true for tissue culture cells, but in vivo was a different story. They were starting to look at expression of transgenes in muscle tissue. John was really interested in therapies for muscular dystrophy. And so they were testing these polycations that had been effective so far for delivering genes into cultured cells, but delivering them into muscle in vivo was the next step. And so the negative control, of course, would be just naked DNA without those polycation carriers. Well, the negative control, the naked DNA, actually worked better for muscle cells, and it was taken up and expressed better than with a carrier. And so that was a surprise to them, but they subsequently did work to try to understand how to deliver genes via the bloodstream and did develop some chemical carriers that were effective, particularly for siRNA. These were called dynamic polyconjugates, or DPCs. That technology was sold off to Roche and subsequently Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals. But the synthetic approaches were having a tough time catching up to viral vectors. Mother Nature had a 1.5 billion year head start on us. The long game for nanoparticles and synthetic carriers still looks good. I think that's going to come to fruition one day. But at that time, adenovirus was one vector that gained momentum and was used at clinical trials at Penn. I remember hearing about these gene therapy clinical trials in the 90s using adenovirus vectors, especially an infamous one led by researchers at the University of Pennsylvania to treat transcobramylase deficiency syndrome, or OTCD, which is a rare metabolic disorder where ammonia builds up to lethal levels in the blood because there's a defective gene that leads to a deficient enzyme in the last step of the urea cycle. 
this gene is X-linked recessive and expressed only in the liver. And babies born with OTCD usually fall into comas soon after birth and, and suffer brain damage. And their lives are unfortunately very short. So this gene therapy was seen as, you know, really important to treat this rare disorder. And with the adenovirus vector, it was delivering a repaired form of the gene that's responsible for this ammonia buildup. Now, I heard about this trial because of news surrounding Jesse Gelsinger, an 18-year-old who was enrolled in the trial. And he had a mild form of OTCD. So he was able to regulate his symptoms with low-protein diet and a pretty large pill regimen to keep his ammonia levels low. He was relatively healthy and agreed to participate in the trial. Now, a number of people were already enrolled in the trial, and the majority that had received the adenovirus vector gene therapy had only experienced mild flu-like symptoms after getting the injection. But things took a different turn for Jesse, didn't they? Yeah, you're exactly right. So Jesse Gelsinger, despite having the disease that he had, he was, I mean, in relatively good health. He was following a special diet, like you said, he was on medication. But following the treatment, there was a massive immune response triggered by the viral vector. So following the treatment, he developed serious cardiovascular and nervous system issues and, and went into a coma. The doctors did everything they could to try to bring him out of it, but there was, there was nothing more that they could do. And the outcome was that he died within four days. And this really rocked the world of gene therapy. I think just overnight, those were two words, gene therapy, that you did not want to put in your grant application. And now, over 20 years have passed since Jesse's death. What has changed to breathe life back into the gene therapy field? The Gelsinger case is infamously known because it was such a turning point. It was the first time someone died in a human gene therapy trial. And the federal government actually subsequently froze all the gene therapy trials that were being overseen at the University of Pennsylvania, not just the one that Jesse was in. But yeah, the, the, the question is, what went wrong in his therapy? What did we learn? What can we do differently as we enter a new age of gene therapy? And so one thing to note here is that Jesse was injected with a adenoviral vector. It's a modified version of a virus that causes common colds, and that contained the corrective gene. And adenoviral vectors, we now know, can cause significant immune responses. That's one of the things we learned from this. And so while there are still some adenovirus-based gene therapies still in development, the field really shifted at that time to focus on another gene delivery vehicle, actually two, which are adeno-associated viruses, or AAV, and lentiviruses. AAV is, is known to provoke very little immune response. And since that time, AAV has really exploded as the vector of choice for in vivo therapies. We've also subsequently learned that there are multiple serotypes for AAV, basically different types of viral capsid that can be used to target different tissues. AAV is smaller, it's simpler than adenovirus, it's non-pathogenic, and it's relatively easy to manipulate in the lab in terms of purification, concentration, things like that. And then lentivirus is most commonly used in the ex vivo therapies, such as CAR-T. It's taken some time since that event to really see some success in clinical trials. Much of that came through advances in basic research and translational work on the types of vectors that are used. And a lot of this was led by pioneers in the field, such as James Wilson at Penn, who was actually involved in the Gelsinger trial. There's Jude Samulski, who was at UNC Chapel Hill at the time, Guangping Gao at UMass. There's a long list of amazing scientists and physicians who have driven this forward. And now gene therapy is slowly accumulating success stories. One that particularly caught my attention is the gene therapy for hemophilia A. Now, in general, hemophilias are blood clotting disorders. And I don't know about you, but I first learned about this when I took a genetics class. And I was learning about pedigrees and X-linked genes and looking at the transmission of hemophilia B throughout European royalty in the 1800s. But hemophilia A is more common, and it's due to genetic defect in clotting factor 8, causing issues with blood coagulation, leading to external internal bleeding. Those with severe cases, which make up about 50% of people with hemophilia A, can experience spontaneous bleeding in the joints or muscles just from simple daily exercises or walking. And they also kind of tend to live in this fear of uncontrolled bleeding events from trauma or from being cut. But the general wear and tear can also decrease life expectancy. Even today, when there 
is one form of a treatment, which is replacing this defective clotting factor through infusions, injections. And depending on the severity of the disease, some people have to get multiple injections per week. So these issues with the disease, with supplying the treatment of the injections, and also potential immune response that can build up against that clotting factor really highlights the need for new treatments for hemophilia. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, for people who are, for the more severe cases, it's kind of terrifying. I would say from a gene therapy perspective, it's exciting in that it's a monogenic disease and you can target the liver for expression and secretion of clotting factors into the bloodstream. There are several ongoing clinical trials and there have been a few developments in the news this year. So early on, people were just treated with infusions of these clotting factors. And then in the 1980s, it was recombinant factor replacement, basically just infusions of recombinant factor eight and factor nine. But the cost for these treatments can be very high. And some patients, like you said, develop inhibitors that neutralize the clotting factors. The next stage along the way in hemophilia treatment was when we discovered and developed extended half-life or EHL factors. And these could be administered at less frequent intervals. You, you mentioned people were getting treated multiple times a week, but these still had a relatively short half-life, which meant you had to continue with the repeated IV injections and inhibitors and cost were still an issue with these products. And then another major advancement came with the development of non-factor therapies. So these could be, in some cases, administered subcutaneously and instead through IV. And this brought the frequency of treatment down to as low as once per month. These were less prone to cause development of inhibitors. And from what I know, these types of treatments were only available for factor eight and not factor nine. The one example I know of is Hemlibra, which is an antibody that mimics the role of factor eight in clotting. The holy grail would be a one-time gene therapy that would provide long-term and curative levels of clotting factors. The questions surrounding that are how long will the expression last? How durable will it be? How high will the expression be? And what is the cost? Either factor eight or factor nine can be packaged in an AAV vector, and these are typically using a liver-specific promoter, and the vectors are designed to be taken up by liver cells and expressed there. The liver is already responsible for producing a variety of components in our blood. And clotting factors, they're already expressed in hepatocytes. So with an AAV therapy, you could utilize the liver to express and secrete functionally active clotting factors into the blood and prevent bleeds. It's interesting to me that there are both in vivo and ex vivo approaches for treating this disease. There are groups that are developing AAV-based gene therapies on the in vivo side, and then others are approaching this on the the ex vivo side, they're using transduction of stem cells that are used for autologous cell therapies. For example, one group has used hematopoietic stem cells that are transduced with lentiviral vectors, and they can achieve therapeutic levels of factor eight expression. They've been able to correct the disease phenotype in a hemophilia mouse model, and some of these have made it to clinical trials. The leader to date has been the therapy developed by BioMarin. Nikki, I don't know if you've followed by Omarin and that story this year at all with their therapy of Octavian. Yeah, I just recently heard a few months ago they had a little bit of a setback, didn't they? Yeah, I think the answer is yes. Front runner with the most advanced therapy for hemophilia has been Biomarin with their Roctavian. And I love that name, by the way. So it's an AAV5-based therapy. And I've looked at the, the news and the data from the phase one, two clinical trials from Biomarin. And what they've shown is that after... About 16 weeks following treatment, out to 40 or 50 weeks, patients are in the normal range. So the therapy is working. But then you can observe over three, four years of follow-up that there's a decline in clotting factor activity levels. And I think they don't have an explanation for that yet. So overall, I would say that this therapy looks promising, even if it may not end up being a lifelong solution. But there's recently been some news surrounding this that you mentioned that reflects a bit of a setback for Biomarin, which is that essentially the FDA rejected their first BLA. To add a little bit more detail there, Biomarin requested accelerated approval in late 2019 on six months of phase three data. So that would have been 16 of the 134 patients in the trial. So they had long-term data 
from phase one, two that, that I mentioned, but only six months from phase three. That was all the FDA had in front of them to evaluate. And Biomarin received something called a complete response letter or CRL from the FDA. And in that, the FDA requested two years of follow-up data from the phase three trial. So what that means, they want two years of data from all 134 patients in the trial. And that phase three original completion date was supposed to be Q4 of 2020. So this year now would have been one year on all 134 patients. But based on the FDA request for two years of data, the trial will finish in the fourth quarter of 2021. We'll have to wait and see how it all plays out. I imagine there are some patients and families out there watching these trials closely that are probably disappointed to see these setbacks and are eager for these drugs to enter the market. Yeah, I imagine a lot of people are eagerly awaiting for, for a better solution to that. And things like gene therapy can really open up a whole world of possibilities, even beyond hemophilia. There's a few FDA-approved gene therapies out there and obviously a lot more in the works. So where is the gene therapy field headed? And what are some of the problems that these researchers are facing when bringing them to clinical trials or to the market? To put things in context, let's talk about what's been approved. So some of the most notable gene and cell therapies on the market are Luxterna, Zolgensma, Kimraya. These are the ones that most people are talking about right now. Luxterna was one that was approved in December 2017. It's a AAV-based therapy developed by Spark, which is now part of Novartis. It corrects an inherited form of blindness. That one has a price tag of $425,000 per eye. It's thought to be a permanent fix to blindness in these patients. Literally, these patients have been without sight their whole lives, and they receive an injection into the back of their eye, and it restores their vision. It's pretty incredible. That's incredible. Solgensma is manufactured by Avexis. That's now part of Novartis Gene Therapies. That one's an AAV9-based therapy for the treatment of pediatric patients that are under two years old that have SMA, spinal muscular atrophy. And it's treating a disease that attacks motor neurons, and it manifests much like muscular dystrophy with progressive loss of muscle control. And their children are dying of this disease. I remember when this drug hit the market, it was considered the most expensive drug ever at over $2 million per patient. It is a life-saving therapy. And then the third one is Kimraya, and that was developed for patients with a form of B-cell leukemia type of cancer that mostly affects white blood cells in, in children and young adults. And that one was also approved in 2017. 2017 was a big year for gene and cell therapy. And I think the following year also approved in the EU. But it works by introducing a new gene into a patient's own T cells that enables them to those T cells to find cancer cells. The last figures I saw in Kim Raya were at 475k per patient. These were the groundbreaking drugs, and they laid the foundation for what's coming next. And the challenge in particular for AAV is the transition away from local therapies like Luxterna, where you're just treating the eye, and you're moving from that to intermediate and systemic treatments that affect larger organs and tissues throughout the body, and the increase in average viral dose per patient also increases. A lot of diseases initially that gene therapy was targeting tended to be more rare diseases with smaller patient populations. But now researchers are looking at diseases that affect a larger portion of the population. So not only do you need perhaps larger doses for more systemic treatments, but you also just need more gene therapy doses to treat more people. Yeah, exactly. So we're, we're multiplying the increase in viral genomes required per patient by the increase in patient population and ending up with a number that our current drug manufacturing capabilities are not ready to deal with. And that, that's a good segue for us to talk about the so-called first versus second wave of gene therapies. To be clear, what we're calling the first wave is really all post gelsinger treatments using safer vectors. But the first wave of gene therapies was focused on smaller patient populations, rare and orphan diseases. And then in the second wave, now we're transitioning to larger patient populations and intermediate and systemic sized doses. So let's contrast the first commercialized assets like Luxterna with something like the Biomarin therapy, Roctavian. With Luxterna, you're treating a small tissue by direct injection, and it requires 1.5 times 10 to the 11th viral genomes per patient, or, or actually per eye. And that has a current patient population in the U.S. of so about one or 2,000. Roctavian, in their clinical trials, was using six times 10 to the 13th vector genomes per patient. 
And this has an estimated patient population of more than 30,000. And then if you're talking about something like muscular dystrophy, Duchenne's, you're, you're potentially looking at viral doses of 10 to the 15th per patient. Or the gene therapy being developed by Voyager for Parkinson's disease could potentially have a very large patient population. About 60,000 people in the U.S. are diagnosed with Parkinson's each year. We're looking at 100x, 1,000x greater demand. And so manufacturing technologies are going to have to keep up with the needs of the industry in terms of volumes, quality, robustness, and, and ease of use. And that scale-up also really contributes to the cost of these gene therapies. For example, the hemophilia A treatment is expected to cost around $3 million USD per patient. Comparing that to a lifetime of injections of factor VIII, those can run about a $1 million per year. So the gene therapy could still be cheaper in the long run, assuming that it's long-lasting. Let's talk a little more in depth about what makes gene therapy so expensive. Let's break it down and see if there's any way to minimize costs to make it more accessible. I mean, I guess I have to say, Nikki, there are certain things that I don't like to cut corners on. And if I were a gene therapy patient, this would be one of those cases. But it used to be that traditional biologics, like monoclonal antibodies and recombinant proteins, were on the high end of the spectrum in terms of manufacturing complexity. Because the reference point was small molecule drugs that didn't require mammalian cell culture or any sort of gene delivery. But now the reference point has shifted. We've gotten very good at making antibodies. There are well-established methods for stable cell line generation and CHO cells. And you're typically only delivering one gene for expressing the protein of interest. So compare that to engineering cells to produce whole viruses. These are much more complex drugs. And to produce them, you're delivering three or four genes to, in this case, suspension 293 cells. And the current technology doesn't really allow you to engineer reliable producer cell lines. You have to actually perform the transient transfection every time you make a batch of these drugs. Stable producer or packaging cell lines are still a big challenge and are not on the near-term horizon for gene therapy. Breaking down the cogs for gene therapy, like plasmids and labor and other consumables, in thinking about costs, a good anchor is, is a 2,000 liter bioreactor. That produces between 10 to the 14, 15, maybe 10 to the 16 viral genomes. Labor is the largest cost uh, at around 40%. Plasmids are also very expensive when produced under GMP. They make up about 20%. And then the rest is a mix of overhead, consumables, but also the downstream purification process. And depending on the therapy and the amount of virus that you need, the cost for manufacturing can vary by a lot. Some are in the range of hundreds of thousands. Some are projected to cost up to about $1.5 million in labor and materials, which just won't be sustainable. And in some cases, that's just enough virus to treat one patient. Now, I want to briefly outline the steps in the workflow that can take a gene therapy to market. It starts with getting your starter culture going and having to do this transfection pretty much every time to package the gene therapy components into the cells that are then going to start producing the virus and that you can then add to large bioreactors in order to get large amounts of cells and large amounts of virus to then later go on and be packaged up into this gene therapy. Along the way, once you seed that bioreactor, you have to lice your cells, clarify the broth multiple times, filter your virus out, go through additional purification steps, with multiple chromatography and enzyme treatments. Then there's additional ultrafiltration and sterile filtration to make sure you have nice sterile product before you go on and preserve your product and aliquot your product into vials that can then be shipped off to various clinics around the world. So there's multiple steps that need to be able to handle these large volumes, these large virus titers. Yeah, you described a very complex process, right? The burning question is what parts of the process should change or upgrade? One of the key factors is moving away from adherent cell culture to suspension culture at high capacity to make the process more scalable. And then on top of that, you need high process yield. And wherever possible, I think... Gene therapy viral vector production will try to follow the same trajectory that monoclonal antibody development has followed. 
That could include development and adoption of specialized HEC-293 cell lines for suspension culture. It would have been CHO cell lines in the case of the antibodies. But improvements in upstream processing, such as higher efficiency transfection, and using chemically defined media to optimize the cell culture conditions, as well as the downstream processing improvements that you mentioned, such as lower loss in filtration and purification. We've developed a technology that we're proud of. We're seeing a minimum of three to four times higher virus titers with our transfection reagent. It's called transit virus gen. Then we do with the other gold standards in the industry for virus production. And then we've developed some enhancers for AAV and lentivirus production that can take it even higher than that. So around 10 or 15, sometimes 17 fold increases in yields. And we're also producing these under CGMPs now. So good manufacturing practices. Starting next year, we'll offer a GMP version of VirusGen. And the reason that's important is because pharmaceutical companies are under more and more pressure to use the safest and highest quality materials from start to finish in their manufacturing process. One curious thing about this reagent is that it's not just transfection efficiency. It's not just how many of the cells express after transfection. There's some additional layer of magic, we'll call it. We don't like to use that word in science that's allowing the cells to produce more virus. And so we hadn't really had the luxury of exploring the in-depth mechanism of why we're getting higher quality, higher functional titers from these cultures using transit virus gen. It just came empirically. We, we screened massive libraries of lipids and polymers to figure out what would just give us the most functional virus. So what this can mean is when you cause the suspension cells to crank out multifold higher amounts of virus is that you can either scale down your process. Maybe you're going from 2000 liter bioreactor to 500 liter bioreactor and you've avoided having to build out an additional GMP suite or you're running fewer batches and those 2000 liter reactors are now covering multiple patients rather than just one patient. Higher yields equals more doses. If you're thinking about that at a COGS that could be projected at $1.5 million for a given therapy, which is completely not sustainable, and I can't imagine what the price tag would be for a patient, improving that process by tenfold brings us down to something that is at least realistic. And if your starting point is in the hundreds of thousands, you're not at that 1.5 million point, then you're in a much more realistic and profitable zone and one that can be delivered to patients without astronomically high price tags. We're focused on transfection, but I think that's just going to be one part of a suite of improvements in the overall process for making this more efficient and affordable. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see as time goes on, all these new innovations that are going to all come together, I imagine, to hopefully make gene therapy more accessible overall. Yeah, I'm excited. And we at Miris are, are excited to be part of driving technology forward for large-scale production of gene therapies and seeing those therapies reach patients that are in need. Our focus has always been on improving gene delivery and the advances in gene therapy that are happening now are some of the most exciting developments in biomedicine. We're just very excited to play a role in that and to be connected to that story in some way. I guess to bring this back to the work that John Wolf and Jim Hagstrom had done in the 90s and early 2000s, I mean, it's very sad to me that John's not here now, but I think it's an honor to his and Jim's contributions to now be facilitating advancements in this field. And it, it's just amazing to see this come full circle with the initial focus at Miris being development of non-viral modalities for gene therapy. And where we ended up was using non-viral reagents to produce the actual viral vectors for gene therapy. It's a great story and one that we're proud to be part of. Yeah, well, thank you very much for this illuminating discussion. It was great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Scientist Lab Talk. This episode was produced by the Creative Services team for The Scientist. Thanks again to our sponsor, Miris Bio. To keep up to date with this podcast, follow The Scientist on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to our podcast channel wherever you get your podcasts.